Thank you all for being here. What I would prefer to do at this point is actually listen to you a little bit. I mean, maybe your response to the portraits, some questions about it, some questions about art and activism, some, you know, anything. I mean, I, I can, yes, that was easy. <laughs> well, that's a good question. They, they, um, the project, the, the American Tell the Truth project. She, oh, she asked me if I was or why haven't I or something like that, um, painted Bernie Sanders. And um, the uh, easy answer is that the Americans to Tell the Truth is a nonprofit. It is actually illegal for me to support a candidate. I mean, if he weren't running, uh, I could do it. Or, and I actually have been lobbied many times before this to paint him and uh, had, you know, was sort of, he, he was on a long list of people that I might paint, but now ex would be inappropriate right at the moment, uh, no matter what I think, you know. I mean, I can talk about him, I just can't tell you to vote for him. You know, Barbara. I think you should tell uh, about how you got into this, by doing one portrait and what you like to No, but I, how many of you were here last night? A lot of you, a lot of people heard that story, so. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> yes? I, just, I believe I'm correct that you're going to be speaking at 5 o'clock at Malaprops. Um, Malaprops, yeah. So I thought I'd give you a chance to pitch that. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I th what I like to do, you know, as, as I mentioned last night, and a lot of you uh, heard me say that, is when I told this story about Woody Guthrie, is that for almost every one of the paintings there are stories like that and it's stories like that that I use in schools and I um, so what I'll probably be doing at Malaprops is telling some stories about uh, some of the people I've painted some of the things they did um, especially the ones that were new to me that I discovered uh, or were brought to me I mean let me I can tell you one of those right now that's, uh, is, is still unfolding for me you know so much of our communal history, our uh, civic history, our civil rights history, our gender history, all these things uh, that have remarkable moments, especially when they involve a certain kind of dedication and perseverance, courage and milit militancy, are not taught in our schools, especially if they had to be militant. I mean, like, you can go into a lot of schools in this country and you can hear about um, Kids, kids know who Susan B. Anthony was. They might know who Elizabeth Cady Stanton was. What they have never heard of is Alice Paul. And without Alice Paul, you know, women still might not have the right to vote. I mean, do you all know who Alice Paul was? Oh, well, there we go. Let me tell that story then. You know, they, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony died in 1904 and 1906. It was 1919, 1920 when Finally, the uh, amendment was passed and women got their rights. How did it happen? And why did it happen? It happened because actually uh, in the, when uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, against his own campaign promises, started to engineer the American people into World War I, uh, the women's movement at the time, uh, who were still sort of lobbying for rights, they weren't being active particularly, they weren't being particularly militant, they were literally just lobbying. And when the war effort started to heat up, they decided that now was the time to hold their tongues. They shouldn't say anything as long as, the, you know, this, that they needed to get behind the war effort like, you know, supposedly everybody else. By the way, before that, you know, 70% of the people were against the United States getting into World War I. There was this amazing effort made, it was sort of the birth of American advertising. Um, an advertising uh, genius, really, a guy named Edward Bernays, who was a, I'm gonna get to this other story in a second here, uh, who was a nephew of Sigmund Freud, um, was hired by Wilson to persuade the American people um, how to get into world, I mean, that they needed to get behind the war effort. This was not the natural inclination of the people. Uh, and his, he had told Wilson that what he could do 
was use um, psychological and emotional factors, not reasoning, not rationality, and that that would actually do it. And of course, that's what was used. He had already been very successful in, in proving his point on getting women to smoke. That was, uh, that was Edward Bernay. He was the one who, who actually encouraged, through a series of, of interesting techniques, gave women permission to smoke. Um, anyways, once women, a lot of women, decided that they should not lobby any longer for their rights, a small group of militant women that were Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, and Esmo Holland, and, and a bunch of others, said, absolutely not. This is our opportunity. Here's a man who's going to the, uh, you know, the people, he's going to the world saying, you know, this is a war to bring democracy to the world. That is going to be our slogan. If he's going to bring democracy to the world, why not here? Why not us? Why not women? And they started marching every single day in front of the White House. And then they were getting arrested, they were getting you know, thrown in jail. Um, and then it started, uh, you know, they weren't getting an, enough of an impact. And so they did some pretty outrageous things. They brought an urn and put it in front of the White House. And every time Wilson gave a speech about bringing democracy to the world, they burned his speeches right there in front of the White House. I mean, can you imagine that today? And when they did that, they got beat up right on the streets. They were getting attacked and beaten on the streets and then hauled away. And that's when they, those kids last night who were incredible, I hope all of you heard those young people uh, give their talk about truth. At one point they mentioned in passing without saying the names about women being force fed and their throats scarred. It was that group of women who were being, had ref went on hunger strikes in prison and were having rubber tubes forced down their throat and raw eggs poured down those tubes. Um, those were the hunger strikes. And interesting, it was all being publicized. And these were all middle, upper middle class women who were doing these things. And as soon as one group got arrested, another group came out and did it. And Alice Paul was really the leader of that group. Wilson was so upset about the continuation of the bad publicity that he finally said, you know, he went to Congress and said, just give these damn women the right to vote. You know, call it what you will. And he's, he finally said, this would be good for the war effort if we give women the right to vote. That's the way he rationalized it. That's what happened. But it was this, and also, by the way, this was the, you know, our civil rights movement in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s was not the first time that massive civil disobedience was used in this country. It was those women. In the, in, the, uh, in the teens, who did it first with great effect. Um, the only thing we don't know is, I mean, I was talking last night, I mentioned about the music of the Civil Rights Movement and how important it was. I don't know if there was any music um, in that movement at all. But anyway, Alice Paul. I uh, painted a portrait of Alice Paul. Uh, could have painted a whole bunch of those women. But it's that kind of thing, you know, and that's the kind of thing that is often not taught into, in our schools is we sort of get an iconic figure, iconic figure like Susan B. Anthony, who was actually pretty militant herself at times. But the, the super militant push that actually forced the country to come to terms with this issue and brought it, put it over the edge isn't talked about. You know, and, it, and of course that's the thing that is so important that you know, in, the, in a so-called democracy where supposedly things happen by people voting and deciding in, a, in some sort of democratic way, uh-uh, it's not the way most of our major just changes happen. They happen often because of a, just like Margaret Mead said, a small group of dedicated people uh, who just won't give up. And they're willing to expend a lot of, take a lot of risks and actually get, get hurt doing it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on that same subject of women's liberation, uh, you, have you done the portrait of Sarah Grimke? Sarah Grimke? Oh, from where, South Carolina? Where's she from? Carolina. South Carolina. The early 18th century. Right. I'm oh, sorry, 19th century. And uh, perhaps the first woman who both uh, was uh, 
an advocate of emancipation and women's Right, yeah, I don't know, I haven't, I, I haven't, yeah. Sumon Kid, which is called the Invention of Wings. The Invention of Wings, yeah. And she deserves to be in your. I think you know, you're, you're right. She, he was suggesting, he asked me if I would painted Sarah Grimke, um, who was a. Well, she was from the South, and she. Um, Charleston. Um, was one of the you know, early advocates of ending slavery and also for women's rights. Um, she left the South, didn't she? And, or was, she did. And there's a contemporary novel about her by Sue Monk Kidd called The Invention of Wings, right? Yeah. Good, good, good suggestion. Thank you very much. Just out of curiosity, how long is your list of... Well, it's got a lot of names on it. Um, and um, I don't... I don't know exactly, and, and they sort of come and go in the sense of, actually, you know, what happened happens is, you know, I've been reminded of her before and thought, oh yeah, that's interesting, I'll, sometime I'll start looking up, and then something like that will happen, where you'll suggest it, and then I'll, I'll go get the book, you know, and maybe do that. Um, it's often just a little push, <laughs> and it makes all the difference, yes. <laughs> she asked me what the selection process is. <laughs> well, to some people in the room, it's probably a little frustrating. <laughs> By the way, I wanna, uh, one thing I didn't forget to do last night is introduce who's here with me. Uh, this is my son standing in the back of the room with the, the camera. <laughs> His name is Aaron. <laughs> and he is not really my son, he's sort of my boss. Uh, <laughs> He's actually the executive director of this whole project, and uh, it, uh, a number of years ago, it became, was becoming way too big for me to do as much as I was trying to do. Paint, talk, travel, write about it, and it was out of control, and, and he, uh, I can't remember exactly the process, but somehow um, he volunteered, sort of, and uh, <laughs> Is, has made this uh, a much more efficient and organized and intelligent um, organization. Uh, he, you know, developed a new website and, and well, anything. We, we run a lot more effectively because of him. His wife, Margo. Hi, Margo. <laughs> He's here also. And she is a writer, uh, currently writing a book about the black women mathematicians who worked at NASA before the era of computers. Wow. And um, her father is a, was an engineer, just retired from NASA, and so she was, as a young girl, was meeting these women who, the early space shots, you know, were not done on computers. There weren't computers, except for the women who were computers. And a lot of them were black women who, I mean, like John Glenn's flight was organized, done on calculators and slide rules by these black women. Anyway, it's an amazing story, and uh, so um, and soon to be a movie too. So uh, anyway, so we uh, before we came here, we were I, I mentioned last night we were in Hampton, Virginia. That's where her family lives to unveil a portrait of uh, Carter G. Woodson, who was the father of Black history in this country. I mean, the Black history movement started a hundred years ago with Carter G. Woodson, who was this, this um, black educator who had realized that um, one of the ways that um, you know, African Americans were taught inferiority, inf their own inferiority was by not having their, knowing their own history and not being taught their own history. And he started the movement which became, was first Negro Week and then became the Black uh, History Month and um, you know, basically to uh, begin to change the idea of sort of internalized racism and uh, had a huge effect and uh, we had this wonderful event where you know I spoke and then she told about her project and uh, it was a lot of fun so actually if you're interested in that please talk to Margot she's the one who's also selling the cards and posters back there yes uh, how long have you been working on this project and how many portraits have you painted so far I painted the, the first portrait in January of 2002. Um, it was just uh, like three or four months after 9-11. Um, and um, 
there, my goal when I started was to paint 50, and there are now 215 or 16, something like that. Um, it's the obsessive compulsive disorder problem now. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, it's just like, you know, you know, he mentions Sarah Grimke, and I'm thinking that would be a perfect addition. I mean, I just don't know how to stop because the stories keep coming. You know, the, you, you, there's always another story, and, and each story is, um, you know, is not only just important to our history and very moving to our history, but it's a great example. I mean, this is really all about kids and, and providing these people and these stories for children. I, I want to tell you a story that illustrates that point in a moment. Uh, but, Steve, let me. Talk about side about the passions that got you involved in this whole thing in the first place, and how have they transformed over the last 13 years? Where are you now? Well, that's a. I mean, I was talking about how I began in a place of outrage and and um, grief and shame and things like that. Although what I prefer to call that rage is what um, the great environmental writer Terry Tempest Williams, who I've also painted, uh, called sacred rage. Um, you know, a very justified and, and necessary rage against monumental injustice. Um, I still feel that, but and I feel all those things. But each one of these portraits is really a labor of love. I mean, it's, it's built in respect and love and, oh, <laughs> enormous admiration. <laughs> <laughs> You're creating a lot. Of All right. Well, you want to go on the stage? Yeah, yeah. Let's go up there. And, okay. And talk. You sure? Yeah, yeah. Good. Just watch your step here. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Let me you get past there, and I'll, I'll hand you this thing. You okay. Hey, y'all let anybody in here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was a, a non rowdy crowd. You got Isaac up in here. <laughs> I think we can do this. Uh, different I think we'll be all right. By the way, your, Good afternoon. Your kids were My name is Wendy Keeson, and I'd like to welcome you to the second day of Americans to Tell the Truth program and exhibit. Our committee is pleased to report last evening's opening gala was a resounding success with over 250 guests, dignitaries, and press in attendance. As most of you know, our Reverend Dr. Barber was unable to be with us last night for the unveiling of his amazing portrait in the exhibit. But he had a really good reason. Mm. Dr. Barber was in Washington, D.C., attending the 45th Annual Legislative Conference Phoenix Awards Dinner, sponsored by the Congressional Black Caucus, where our own President Barack Obama was the keynote speaker. I think it's a good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Barber received the 2015 Phoenix Award for being instrumental in the release of the Wilmington 10 and for being a pillar of the National Grassroots Movement for Justice for two decades. <laughs> Dr. Barber continues to lead the fight for voter rights in North Carolina, health care reform, worker rights, immigrant rights, and reparation for women survivors of eugenics. Also with us again today is Rob Shetterly, of course, that we've been visiting with. He's gifted us with his, his not only his work, but his, his, uh, his story behind them. 
And he did, of course, paint the 53 portraits we're celebrating in the Asheville exhibit. He requires no further introduction. We think his work speaks volumes. He and Dr. Barber are on stage today to discuss truth, courage, and activism. Please join me in welcoming them to this very important and exciting dialogue. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think what I would like to hear, and maybe what I'd like you to talk about, is what happened last night. <laughs> Tell a little bit about that, how it felt, and uh, what you thought might have been accomplished because of it. Um, first of all, let me just say, okay, so, so, let me just say, uh, first of all, how honored I am uh, to be here, and honored uh, that you would uh, receive my children um, the way you did. They are talking about it because, you know, sometimes they, well, I can't keep from them the hate. Uh, I have to show them some things and they see the hate now, they see it, and you have to show it from not to, so that they're covered in it, but so they can get a sense of how the things they, should, they don't want to become. And you did a lot for them last night, so I want to thank you. Um, that's all they've been talking about, um, but shout out to you and the people here and how kind you were. Um, and in and, and particular, I must say this, um, when you um, are recovering from fears, um, you know, one of my worst, earliest memories was being about 12 years old in my uncle's house who had married a white woman from Indiana whose son, early that day, had been beat up by some young um, boys at school who claimed to be young in the Klan. And uh, he well, actually beat them up. <laughs> and so they decided to come by a house that night and seeing a fire start outside of the house, and it was a cross. And my uncle, um, who uh, had no proclivity toward of being nonviolent, um, basically said, get the shotgun, go to the back door, and whatever comes through, deal with it. Thank God we didn't have to do that. But, you know, that early on put some challenges in me and some fears about dealing with people that may not come from the same community of our lot. So every time I'm around audiences that may be predominant white, particularly after I've gotten some of the ugliness, you know, when a few weeks ago when the <clears throat> march from Selma to Alabama came through, Selma to DC came through, the first email we got in the our office was tagged hangernigger.com. And it went downhill from there. So coming, my children being able to see our audience of black and white last night and people inspires them and 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 continues to help to heal me. Um, so First of all, I, I, before I even get to last night there, I want to talk about the spirit of last night here that came there. And I received the award not unto myself, but on behalf of the movement. Because um, we are setting a pace and a, setting a standard for movements around the country. Mall Monday has broken out now in about 12 other states. And Jim Forbes and I are going to be talking about doing a radical revolution of moral values tour and revival. Um, and coming in January, the 16 states um, across this country because it's time. Some issues are not about left and right, they're about what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> it's about simply telling the truth and the truth of But to be, to be there with the, the son of Amelia Boyant, who died, so she, she died earlier this year. Two years ago, I met her in Selma. She said, son, I'm gonna stay here till y'all start fighting. And I like, I want to believe that she went on to her spirit release from this earth because she sees us fighting. I had the privilege to walk across the bridge with, with her this year and um, with the young lady that was, she was very bright skinned and part of the movement in Selma. Um, uh, Diane Nash? Diane Nash. In fact, Diane Nash grabbed my hand because everybody was at Brown Chapel where all the cameras were. We were out there with the people. And Diane said, come on, 
because the day before she wouldn't walk the bridge because George Bush was there. She just she said, I'm not gonna do it. And I and, and, and I didn't either. I could have gone and I said, No, I'm not doing that. And it's, it's not about being ugly, it's about being truthful. And uh <laughs> We walk across the day. So last night, quickly to answer, to see some of the, the leaders and people who have done so much uh, was powerful. Um, but I did challenge last night, and I said, we are in a deep moral crisis when 50 years and 43 days after the signing of the Voting Rights Act, August 6, 1965, we have more gun rights than we have voting rights. And when the Congress is refusing to do what the Constitution gave them the power to do in 1870, because in 1870, the Constitution, the 15th Amendment, said that no one born or naturalized can be denied or abridged a bridge, not just denied, a bridge, the right to vote, and that the Congress has the, to, the right to enforce, has not just right, has responsibility to enforce. So when Shelby struck down Section 4, and I said this last night, um, because I didn't just want to do some remarks, you know, just thank you for the award, it's about the movement. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said to them, plus I knew it, you know, I didn't want to embarrass you by this speaking truth portrait. Situation. And the first time I had the opportunity to do it, and the very night that you were unveiling it, I got so caught up in the glitz and the glamour that I didn't think through. So I said to the Black Caucus and to all of them, it's a travesty. It's a travesty that Republican leadership has not um, has not done its duty. It's a travesty that Democrat leadership has not in mass stood up together and said it ought to be done. And and the fact that. Um, in essence, we have allowed in this country, without a great moral outcry, uh, except for on the ground, um, the Congress to engage in a two-year filibuster. Now, let's put this in context. Sean Thurman, peeing in a court job, Mason job, pickle job, did a filibuster for 24 hours and 30 minutes. I think in 1957, okay, 25 This Congress has engaged in a filibuster for two years, actually for 14 months, ever since June 25, 2013. And June 25, 2013 is the same date in the 1700s when, when, former, when, when, when slaves presented um, papers to the Massachusetts, legis Massachusetts legislature demanding their freedom. So, so the day that used to be a great day in, in history, liberation, June 25th, is now a day that will go down in infamy. And for two years, we've allowed a political filibuster, which is why last night when I saw my president, I, I, President Brooks, I said, you know, we, we, will, we will help you walk from Selma to, to D.C. We will go in this Tuesday and we will lobby and advocate for the Voting Rights Amendment Act. But understand what we're doing in the South. We're checking off the six steps to civil disobedience. And the last one is that you go in <laughs> and you attempt to talk with those who are defined. So this past Tuesday, we checked that off. The next time I go to D.C. with anybody over voting rights, it's going to be with clergy, investments, and other folk to lay down in the halls of Congress and demand that they pass the And with that, well, thank you. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> I want to follow up on that by saying a couple of things about this kind of pro process and what seems to be necessary. Just before you came in, we were, I was talking about, we were, we were talking about the women's movement mm. and how it, nothing really changed until it became militant and became, it was Alice Paul and Lucy Burns and these women who were willing to take great risks to force things to change. You stay seated. I'm just going to stretch my leg. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, 